Hello guys and welcome to today's STPL. I wasn't sure if I was going to be joined by Rapid today, but uh, looks like he must be asleep, which is fine. It's like 5am or 4am in Korea, so it's all good. But either way, um, what am I saying? What am I saying? It's uh, STPL. Bleh. Oh my god, I haven't been casting enough. I need to like, I need to get back into like the three day a week casting because I'm completely out of it now. Uh, we're in the semi-finals, we are in the second quarter final today. Uh, no rapid today, I don't think Caster me is, he may turn up a little bit later, I'm not too sure. But um, as always, you're up at European times, so it still amazes me that you managed to do this. <laughs> like you were up yesterday watching, what was on yesterday, the LA LAN, you were, you were up up watching that like 5 a.m korea time i just don't get it i don't get how you managed to do it man but it's it's all cool uh let's have a look at the fixtures because obviously we are heading into the second quarter final this is going to be between white and net wars over on the other side of the bracket last week we saw rev take on irk uh with irk winning three to one that means they're going to be up against Seoul in the semi-finals and whoever wins here is going to be up against valhalla team so this could be a pretty crazy bracket. I mean, it's already been a pretty crazy bracket anyway. I don't know how many of you did the bracket contest, but I know that I think my predictions were completely off. Because, uh, I mean, I thought Nas were going to be red, but there we go. Uh, but either, either way, my net was a strong team struggling a little bit uh, since the departure of Bonnet and True Touch at the end of last season. Uh, but they're still, I mean, they still made it to the quarterfinals of the... Uh, quarterfinals of the tournament, which is just crazy. So let's have a quick look at the player rankings. I mean, there's not really too much to talk about with this, other than the fact that good players are good. Uh, Avi has actually made it into the top ten. I know that was one of his goals uh, for the STPL season two, and he's done it with an incredibly long win streak. So uh, Avi definitely making his way, earning his way up there. Tai Two and Yeti clinging on to eighth place. Uh, just above Avi now, both on 2170. And then above them are just really, really good players. Like, you've got Scan and Noob in the top two positions still. Uh, like, arguably the best players in the league. Or, without a doubt, actually, based on ELO. Koga in third. I mean, Koga is a player who doesn't really play too many solo tournaments anymore. Comes out in STPL and always kills it. He's won 34 of his 41 games. Like, how crazy is that? And then you've got DeWalt just behind him, winning 41 games. That's 41 weeks worth of games that DeWalt has played, and he's won every single one of them. And then obviously he's got 10 losses as well, but... Absolutely ridiculous. Like, DeWalt is so, so good. Definitely a team league master, winning so many best of ones. And the thing that gets me, and no one else, well... Other people probably agree with this. STPL is a long, long tournament, right? DeWalt has played 51 weeks of STPL. That is almost a single year worth of games playing once a week. Obviously, there's been a load of different gaps, and it's been over about two and a half, three years now. But that's a lot of games for someone to play. Uh, let's introduce our two teams for today. Starting us off here is going to be Net Wars, so... It was, as I mentioned before, struggling a little bit. Well, I say struggling, they're still doing so so well, but in terms of um in terms of like overall skill level, their players are still incredibly good. Uh Jesse, definitely one of the weaker players on the Netwars roster, stepping in when Catspaw couldn't play. Uh but essentially Yeti, Kogat, and Zero. I mean Yeti's won his last four games. Kogat's won his last four as well. His fourth game was uh, actually a walkover. Then you've got Zero winning his last three as well. Like, that's so, so good. They are so good at this game, man. They're all really, really good. The problem they do have, though, missing Bonnet and True Touch, is if they do make it to the best of sevens, they've got a bit of a problem with sort of top-tier lineups for a best of seven roster. Like, you need six good players. Ziggy, unfortunately, couldn't play this week uh, because he was casting... I am Katowice, and he just got back, and I think he didn't want to play, but that's fine. Uh, still, regardless, a very, very strong lineup for them now. Of course, White Clan, one of the other strong, strong teams, the STPL Season 1 semi finalist, and White Clan have got one of the biggest rosters I've ever seen of any single team in any game. 
they have something like over 80 players in their roster and a lot of them i mean they may not come out every time and play every time but they've got some mainstays like yes man famasi unfortunately couldn't make it this week so he got replaced by tengu uh fairy a very very strong player that's been playing for them this season and you kind of see the stark difference between the two teams because with net wars all of the players minus jesse had played a ton of games whereas all of the white clan people other than yes man who's played 15 weeks of stpl and fairy who i think has played every single week of season two uh i mean tengu comes in every once in a while i think he played against scan in the season one finals and sack uh i can't actually remember the games he played but we'll obviously see the histories as we get further in but overall i think this is a really cool matchup like we've not got the heaviest hitters of white clan of course they don't have best they don't have mind they don't have higher and killer out of course i think killer's actually in the military now unless i'm mistaken uh but they've still put in a really good roster so let's have a look at who who's going to be playing against who here of course very normal uh, to see the players in the same order, but we're going to have a PVT between Yeti and Yesman. That's going to be our new Tornado. We're going to have a, TV, a TVT sorry, between Koga and Tengu on Blitz X. That's another TVT on that map, which is kind of crazy. Uh, then we're going to have a PVZ between Jesse and Fairy. I need to change Jesse's uh, race. We'll do that in one of the breaks. That's fine. And then we're going to have a ZVZ between Zero and Sack. So we've got two... Uh, We've got two mirrors today, which isn't great, but not too bad. And we've also got two non-mirrors, so... And this will be a fast group, I imagine. Um, or a fast set of games, should I say. But TVT always has a chance of going long. PVT has a chance of going long. PVZ has a chance of going long as well. It's just going to be the ZVZ that should be over in less than like 10 minutes, I would imagine. It's hard for ZVZ to go that longer. And if it does, it's friggin' amazing. So hopefully we get to see that. Uh, let's have a look at our first couple of players here. Starting us off for Net Wars is going to be Yeti. Now, in case you haven't seen the new production so far... Uh, Yeti is, of course, his actual self now, rather than the Russian one. Uh, but the crown means 30 wins. Uh, the stars are 5 wins each, so Yeti doing really well. I mean, he is in the top 10, rank 8, not too bad. Against Terran, he's got a 64% win rate and a 71% win rate overall, which is just... I mean, that's crazy to me. Like, I can't begin to imagine to explain how difficult that is. You look at his last 10 games, he's only lost one of them, and that was that was over two months ago. Like, Yeti is a really, really strong player in Team Leagues. Like, he doesn't do great in BSL, and he is actually suffering from uh, wrist injuries at the moment. But even so, he comes out, plays each week, and kills it. He's really, really good. I don't know what else to say. Now, his opponent for White Clan is going to be Yes Man. Now, Yes Man isn't someone I know personally as much as Yeti, of course, but Yes Man's still a pretty good player. He's won 12 is uh, 12 is 15 games, which is pretty crazy. Rank 18 in ELO. He's won seven of his last 10 games, taking losses, though, to some of the top Terrans. I'm oh, sorry, some of the top uh, foreigners in the league, Terra, DeWalt, and True Touch. So, oh, wow, he's not actually played for a while. I guess he played at the end of January, but he definitely played a little bit more in Season 1, because True Touch hasn't played for Net Wars in Season 2, and that was actually back in the, uh, the 20, 2019, like the 6th, uh, Ju sorry, June 2019 was when we were doing the uh, STPL1 playoffs, so that's a while ago. <laughs> but yeah, 88% win rate, I am serious, he is a very strong player. Let's have a look at the map they're going to be going into, of course. This is STPL. It's season two still. We've seen these maps a lot. In terms of balance in TVP, uh, Terran have definitely had a bit of an edge over their Protoss opponents, but when you look at the kind of skill difference between the players, uh, it's the, the recent games haven't been too bad, but early on, uh, there was a lot of Terran players beating up low-level Protoss players. So that's just the way I think it goes sometimes. We've had a lot of TVTs on this map, which is kind of crazy given the fact that uh 
if you think about it, Season 1 in SDPL barely had any TVTs, so we've had tons in Season 2. That makes me a very happy Terran player, uh, but it's, it's been pretty good. But this map is really cool for TVP, very dynamic, very easy to take a third base. It's also quite easy to push across the map. Uh, that you, it hasn't started, you've not missed a game, so we're just about to go into game number one in a second. Just kind of going through the motions as I always do to start things off. I've also got a lovely cup of tea. I've also got a cold, so uh, I've had a cold now for about a week. Luckily enough, I don't think it's coronavirus, given the fact it's affected my sinuses and that doesn't. Uh, but I've been very paranoid about that recently, so uh, hopefully other people uh, won't feel as paranoid as I do, because it really doesn't help. But yeah, uh, Tornado is a struggle for PvT because of those plateaus. But also, if Protoss can engage Terran when they're in the, in the middle of the map, it's a lot better for them. There's a lot of room to flank, and uh, yeah, they're, they're basically it's all about not getting yourself contained. So yeah, tons of people are sick. Like I was on, um, just before I get into the game, I was on public transport going into London all week, and essentially it was horrible. Like I felt paranoid about coronavirus anyway. And then essentially I'm being put in two really, really packed trains in a row with people coughing and spluttering all around me. And it's like, oh my god, that's uh, not something you want. But either way, let's get into game number one. It's Yeti versus Yes Man. And it's going to be here on New Tornado. Okay, starting us off here in the bottom right hand corner, we do have the Yellow Terran fighting for White Clan. It's Yes Man. His name, if you put White's full clan name in, is just way too long. <laughs> White Clan Yes Man. Also, that sounds very bad. Caster Muse, I know. Uh, let me try and explain this simply. The White's name is not good in English, it sounds very racist. <laughs> So I try not to use their full clan name, but they've been a clan since 1998, so they're not going to change it. Uh, but we do have, uh, in the bottom left-hand corner, the red Protoss player fighting from Poland. It's Yeti for Net Wars. So, PBT, it's been a while since I've casted. When I say a while, it's been seven days, which is, I'm getting kind of stir-crazy not casting, but these are two strong, strong players, as Caster Muse says, which is really good to see. Hopefully it means we're going to get a little bit more of a macro game, but uh, one statistic about Yeti that a lot of people may not know, if you only really follow the BSL, if you don't follow the SUPL too much, especially Season 1, given how ridiculously long it was, uh, Yeti was one of the few players who took down Bjol uh, for Soul in a macro game. So Bjol, in case you don't know who he is, is the player who got into ASL season 6 and 7. Uh, he fell in the round of 24 uh, both times, I believe, but he is still an incredibly strong player to be able to make it that far. Now, Yeti took a a PVT off of him with carriers after about 40 minutes of non-stop crazy action so that was yeti before he had his wrist problems but yet he has been taking it a little bit easy he doesn't play as much these days and he rests his uh, rests his wrists on off days from what i understand uh, but essentially when he comes out in the stpl he still puts on a spectacle uh, a lot of the time you'll see him go into from reavers into carriers that's kind of his thing uh carriers i definitely see are a little bit better on this map compared to Arbiters, uh, but Arbiters definitely do have their place. Now, the reason why I say that about carriers is I feel like your main is incredibly exposed from around the outside. Uh, you can also... Let's just reveal the map. I'll just show you what I'm talking about. Essentially, you can sit your carriers here, or you can sit your carriers here. You can expand to this base. I've seen players put shield batteries on here as well, and you just constantly assault the main. So... Very difficult map for both team or both players actually, because there's a lot of like shenanigans both player or both teams can get up to. Now, 
Uh, one other thing about this map you may not know is the minerals in the natural are, I think they're double of a normal natural. So you'll see they've got 2,000 minerals. The minerals in the main start with 1,500. So the naturals last a very long time. Now that does benefit Terran a little bit more given the fact it does give them the option of going for more vultures without any worry of mining out super quickly. And it allows you to stay on two base for a while, but even with Protoss, they do get the benefit. They get extra gateways. They, of course, get extra zealots. And if they do go carriers, it's a lot of extra interceptors just off of your first two bases, uh, which is definitely a little bit better. Usually carrier players need to get a third, or they kind of mine out a little bit too quickly to make it work. Uh, but on this map, it takes a lot to mine out of that natural. So I don't know if we're going to see that come into it. We've got an expansion coming in here for Yes Man. Off the back of a factory, he's going to be able to mine expand. Very normal these days. Uh, meanwhile, Yeti is going in uh, two gate power goon, actually. So two gate power goon lets him go in for a little bit of pressure early on. Allows you to put a lot of pressure on that bunker at the front, uh, which can be very annoying for Terran. And it's also going to help him a little bit because he'll have plenty of Dragoons to be able to deal with any possible Vultures getting behind uh, the Mineral Line. But if he gets all of these, he gets all the uh, Marines, so this bunker is completely worthless now. This is Yeti's very typical uh, early game aggression where he doesn't have much, but he gets a ton done with it. Look at the amount of mining time that's being wasted here. Now the Zeller obviously does, or the Vulture, sorry, does get out. Uh, which is going to cause Yeti some problems when the mines start coming in. But Yes Man is taking a ton of damage here. This is definitely what Net Wars need in this series uh, to start them off strong. But oh! Okay, only one of the mines goes off. It only hits one of the Dragoons. He does manage to snipe the other one, which is incredibly good. There is finally a Marine in this bunker. Uh, does need to be careful of the mines, but he's going to run past. He knows there's no mines there. Staying in range of the bunker. Very questionable decision, though. Going to be taking a ton of damage on these Dragoons. Does manage to take down another one of the Vultures, though. One of them heading down into the natural of his opponent. A lot of SCVs actually being taken down. But look at this. The two-game Power Goon coming into effect here very nicely. Now, this Dragoon is on seven kills. About to get his eight. A tank is going to come in and ruin this Dragoon's day but not without doing a ton of damage. The supplies show everything. 24 supply for Yes Man, 38 for Yeti, starting with a massive head start. Already up, eight workers as well, and going into his robo, doing a very, very good job so far. Now, it'll be interesting to see where Yes Man takes him from here. Okay, it does look like he's getting her for a drop now. This can also be used for a wraith. Uh, dropship first is usually more normal. Uh, what you got to remember in this game is Yes Man has already lost about three vultures. So you don't have the sort of stopping power uh, that you would normally have with uh, that drop. Because the drop comes out very quickly. You already have the four vultures and you also have additional ones uh, to run into the natural when speed is done. And that's not something he has. Like speed is very, very far from being completed here. Uh, Albert, he got some SCVs, a couple of Marines, uh, three Marines in fact, four Marines, and two Vultures, and like four SCVs or something. He did a ton of damage early on, but here we go, the Dragoons coming in, the High Dragoon count definitely helping very, very well. Now, Yes Man is going to have to try and make something happen here, because you don't necessarily want to be start off from behind against Protoss like this, but you can already see Yes Man's SCV production has been a lot more steady than uh, Yeti's probe production. Yeti definitely cutting a few probes here and there to get his gateways out, uh, get his observatory up. Now, there is mines over here blocking the possible third base, but if he is going to go into carriers, uh, going for this base would actually be a little bit better, although it is incredibly close to your Terran opponent, so you do need to be careful. Uh, I can't remember how many goons he's lost, unfortunately, but I don't think it's that many. Uh, yeah, he lost three, I think. He lost the initial three. Yeah, it was a nice trade. Now, the dropship is still not in production. Yes, man, going to save up some money to get an extra factory on here. Now, 
Does he plan on trying to take a quick third? It looks like he wants to go for his armory. Very, very standard timing. But here we go. The drop. Oh, sorry. The drop is actually in already. Uh, Yeti's Dragoon's actually out in the middle of the map. Unable to come back and defend. This is not a good look for Yeti here as he is going to be struggling a ton dealing with these vultures. Oh, no. The mine. Oh, that could have been bad. Okay. Right. We have a Dragoon at the bottom of the ramp. The probes are safe. Okay, yeah, they're safe for now, but he does do quite a bit of damage, and that's perfectly, perfectly good for Yes Man. Three kills, nine kills on these vultures, and one of them's going to get away as well. Now, Yeti does look like he's getting ready to take a third base. This is probably the furthest base away from it. Oh, no, the mine. He had an observer there, and he still ate the mine. That's a little bit unfortunate. But yeah, that definitely evened up the situation in the game. Yes, man, going to be feeling good about that. He knows now that he can expand to his third on location, which is exactly what he's going to do. And he's going to get his third the same time as the Protoss player. Now, looks like we've got a couple of scans going in. One of them checking the production. One of them check. Oh, one of them checking the natural, I think. One of them checking the main. And just overall, he is just trying to see everything that's going on. Now, another Vulture getting dropped off in the main. Unable to do too much. The Dragoon's definitely in a better position now to defend. But really, moving all of his Dragoons out in the middle of the map there caused a ton of problems. Johnson saying the graphic in the top left is a bit too big. I can make it smaller, but I didn't think it was a problem. If it is too bad, I'm going to be changing it slightly anyway for Season 3, so we'll probably keep it as it is for now. If I try and resize it now, it's going to mess up the effect in the uh, fade and stuff. The other thing is, I don't know if you guys have ever watched old Pro League, but the old Pro League... <laughs> the old Pro League overlays were massive compared to this. Especially because it was 4x3 back then as well. Okay, Dragoon's moving out on the map. Just seeing what they can do. Trying to clear up some of the mines, but does need to be careful. He's got Observer Speed. Which isn't the most common thing to do in uh, TV or in PVT, should I say. But just trying to make sure he can defend all of his probes. Now, oh, the, the Vulture's going to check. Wait, what? Where are these vultures? Oh, the vultures coming in from the side. Gonna lay some mines behind the dragoons. Probes do manage to get up there completely unscathed, which is a bonus. Uh, but he is gonna have to be careful. Does need to split his attention even further. Now, there is a vulture drop in the main again. Yes, man, being very active with these drops. It really does surprise me. Uh, that yet he isn't keeping at least some dragoons back at home, given the fact he does know his opponent has that dropship still. Very, very big oversight, I would say, uh, in this game by him. But it looks like he is going to be able to clean up the vultures for now. No, he doesn't. Doesn't even get the. Oh, he doesn't even get the dropship. A little bit unfortunate, but does need to make sure he leaves something down here, or even even uh, move, click, and observer onto the dropship, so you know where it, when it's moving. Uh, but Vulture's trying to run by the Dragoons in the middle to try and see if they can get some probe damage done. Unable to do so, uh, but does need to be careful with these Dragoons. Doesn't want to run into any mines. We do have a couple of cannons coming up over in the top left-hand corner to help defend these probes a little bit more. Yeah, it'll balance a lot better with the top left. Um, essentially when I can change the logo. The STPL Season 2 logo is the wrong kind of shape for it. Uh, but we'll fix it for Season 3, it's fine. I might even redo the uh, top left overlay. It was kind of something I threw together, wasn't completely happy with, but I thought it looked good, so I kept it. <laughs> now, we do have a lot of tanks here. Plus one attack is done. Plus two is on the way. Good time here. We've got one, two, three, four, five factories uh, with vessels coming in as well. Third base is up. The third gas is about to start running as well. Now, Yeti looks like he wants to come in from above here to try and get some damage done. He's going to be able to clean up some of these mines, but he is not going to be able to deal with these tanks. The Vulture is actually getting the Zealots out on their own. Not a position that Yeti wants to be in. And no speed on those Zealots yet. Leg speed still not done. Now, Yeti is still 
in a pretty good position in this game, although he is slowly starting to fall behind in supply, so does need to be careful, and yet he needs to make sure he doesn't take a fight here. There is not nearly enough Protoss and way too much Terran down here with plus one attack to try and deal with this. Now, Yeti is going to wait. He's going to go and take a third or fourth base in the other main. That's giving him the option of going into another gateway farm against what I said before. He Oh, he is going to go carriers. So uh, he's going like lane carriers here. Now, yes, man did just scan. He scanned the fleet beacon and the stargates as well. So yes, man's going to know he's on a timer here. But given the fact the fleet, beacon has, uh, the fleet beacon has only just begun, I think he has about four minutes but we're four or three minutes before he needs to worry about any carriers. And when that happens, it'll only be two of them. So he's still in a good spot. He should start to look uh, to get ready to go on for a little timing push here. 2-1 should finish in time to push as well. And yet he isn't really in a position where he can attack anything uh, that Yes Man has. So yet he does need to be careful not to be too... Uh, trying to think of the right word. Too... Too... Uh, he needs to be careful with his units, essentially, because if he runs out of units, or if he suicides on the Terran army, that's going to be game over, because this timing push is going to come out at 2-1, probably around 30 seconds time or so, when he gets around 180 supply. And when he does that, Yeti is going into carriers, so he doesn't actually have that much on the ground. They don't, of course, have any ground upgrades. I don't believe that he went for Storm. Uh, we don't see any High Templars in production or anything. And he doesn't really have the tools necessary to deal with the Terran army yet uh, without those carriers. Now, if he can delay long enough, he's definitely in a good spot. But you can see Yes Man isn't really in a rush to win the game. He's going for a fourth base over in the top right. That's the furthest place away from the carriers. going to be very difficult uh, for Yeti to be able to engage into this. So you can already see that Yes Man's army is much, much bigger than Yetis, and that's not something you want to have happen as Protoss. Yes Man is actually up 30 supply, a lot of that is in Vultures, so it should die fairly quickly. Uh, but Yeti is on the run here, a lot of his supply is actually in those carriers that are building. And he's in a bit of trouble if he can get this, oh he gets the vessel, that's actually a pretty good pick off. If he can maybe mix in some DTs now, the oh the mine drag! That's pretty good, but there's no Goliaths, but the, I mean the <laughs> carrier only has one interceptor. Hopefully he's got the Inceptor upgrade. I guess he has, given the fact he's going over 4 now. Uh, but this is not looking good for Yeti. Yes, man, with a ton of tanks left over, a ton of vultures, going to be reinforcing this. And what does Yeti have in the top left to defend his bases? Now, as I mentioned before, it's not the end of the world. He's going to have a lot of minerals in his natural for carrier interceptors. But as soon as the Goliath count starts getting higher here, how is he going to win this game? I think Yes Man may have just kind of almost checkmated Yeti here because although Yeti has a chance, he is going to be fighting from very, very far behind. 2 1 attack is, of course, done. Uh, plus 1 attack is done for Yeti here, but the carriers are going to be the real story. Can the carriers realistically do the damage he needs to do? He kind of got into a position like this against Biol, and he did manage to bring the game back. So, can he repeat that victory back in the uh, pro. Uh, SCPL Season 1 playoffs, so I'm not too sure. But now the carrier count is slowly starting to increase. We're going to have three carriers at a time. The gas is obviously going to be a problem, and Yeti doesn't have that many mining bases, so going for the minerals is going to be a little bit difficult. But he does have a ton of money for interceptors, but here we go. The Goliaths are starting to come in. There's tanks sandwiching these Dragoons on the high ground, and it looks like this could be it. The carriers are not in a position to come back and defend against this. The the Dragoons aren't even on the high ground. There we go. They get taken down. And yet he is essentially in a race against time. One of the carriers is coming back. The other two on their way back as well. But he's going to lose his natural expansion here. And going to be knocked down to one base against a four base Terran. And that is definitely a sad sight to see here for Yeti. He's done a good job. He's tried his best. But unfortunately in this game... Yeah, uh, I mean, yes, man, he scanned perfectly, and he used his army well. Like, he didn't make any major mistakes. We've got some DTs coming out here. Panic DTs, I like to call these. Uh, the DTs definitely going to help. They do do a lot of damage. It can be very difficult 
to scan during all this as the Terran player, but yet he about to lose one of his carriers, does need to be careful, he has vision over the high ground, he needs to run the back, losing these carriers, they're the only units he has that can keep him alive in this game, but they're getting far too close, one of the carriers goes down, GG, yet he taps out, and yes man wins game number one. So one thing I will say about that game is yet he tried his hardest there, but unfortunately he played it a little bit greedy, going for a very quick four base and going for very quick triple Stargate carriers. Unfortunately, if that doesn't get scouted, that is an incredibly strong thing to do. But if your opponent scouts it, they are just going to push. And that's what happens when they do. So I'm going to go for a quick break. And when we get back, we'll see game number two. It's going to be a TVT between Koga and Tengu. See you guys soon. Outstanding. Rock and roll. Time for a quick tip here we have neo outlier i'm going to show you how to get over these temples with a probe i'll also do it with an scv and a drone as well so what you do is you essentially send the probe up to mine you press stop and you go to build a pylon now you build the pylon underneath you so essentially it's going to push you then you spam right click and all of a sudden you are through and here is the same trick with terran uh, there's a couple of ways you can do this one of them is you build a depot and you can't or you essentially cancel building and you just spam yourself through you have to be kind of stuck or either on the building in the temple or there uh, you can cancel that and just to show uh, you can do it both ways as well okay now there's a way you can do this with just two workers which is the only way zerg are able to do this uh, you can also do this with protoss and terran as well so essentially you get both workers lined up here you mine with one worker you send the second worker to mine just behind it and you hit stop it can be a little bit finicky so don't worry if you don't get it first try we got it oh uh, no we didn't yes we did okay so that didn't go perfectly you can do it a lot better than that uh, but it does take a little bit of practice so just keep trying and you will eventually get it and you'll find it actually has quite a lot of uses in various different maps Okay guys, welcome back. As you can see, we are going to be heading into Blitz X for game number two. I don't know if you just saw in the previous screen I put together with a ton of different stats. Two of our longest games in the SDPL have gone on on this map. Like, uh, we had an hour long game. We had a 45 minute game here as well, I think it was. Uh, looking at my own thing, yeah, 48 minute and an hour and six minute one. So, definitely a long map in terms of what's going on. Now, the two players we have here are actually really good at TVT, so this should be a really, really fun matchup. Uh, if you've not seen Blitzx before, where have you been hiding? It's been in the SCPL Season 2 for like, I don't know, like 12, 
well, 13 weeks, 14 weeks now. So lots of games been played on this map. Really, really fun map in general. Let's have a look at the two players we've got. Starting us off for Net Wars is the one that you guys should all know. It's Koga. Koga, one of the best players outside of Korea, especially when it comes to the STPL. Uh, he is the number three player in STPL, and that's just behind Noob and Scan. So just want to point out, Koga has a 91% win rate versus Terran, and his last 10 games, he's won. How crazy is that? He is currently an 82% win rate overall. You look at the last 10 players he's played against, he's been up against some very strong players from their respective teams, and he's won every single one of them. Like, he beat Eriador last week in this, uh, in the, I, I guess it was like the round of eight, uh, when it comes to the would it be the round of 8? No, it'd be the round of 16 of the playoffs, and he's just a really, really good player overall. Uh, his best map is actually New Arkanoid. He's won every single game on that map. Uh, wait, let me just double check. Yeah, he's won all seven games he's played on New Arkanoid. So he's coming out here on Blitz X. Uh, his record on this map is actually two wins, one loss. So uh, not doing too bad here on Blitz X is our Koga, uh, is our Terran hero here, but. Let's have a look at his opponent. It's going to be for White Clan. It's going to be Tengu. Now, Tengu, you guys may not know him very well. He's only played two games in the SCPL. One of them he won. One of them he lost. He won against Zero. He lost to TVT against Scan. So, very, very difficult TVT opponent to have. The game lasted around 26 minutes. Hence why it's, uh, why it's his average game duration versus Terran. But... I mean, that's, that's all you can really say. Like, he's a really good Terran player. Gets caught off guard by Scan. It was a really, really sick game they played on uh, Carthage 3, by the way. So if you want to go back and check that out, it's on the YouTube channel, uh, SCPL TV. You can go and check that out during the break of uh, the quarterfinals ending and the semifinals next week. But we have a really good lineup here of Terran for you guys to watch. So let's not waste any more time. Let's get in to game number two. It's Koga versus Tengu here on Blitz X. Okay, starting us off here in the top left-hand position, we do have the Orange Terran fighting for Net Wars. It's Koga. And his opponent spawning up here in the top right-hand position, we do have the White Terran player fighting for White Clan. It's Tengu. Now it is TBT on Blitz X. This map is incredibly easy to split down the middle. We've seen it many, many times in TBT here. One of the stats I actually want to put together uh, for sort of season three time is I want to get a list of like the average, like an actual list of like the total duration of time spent on the map. I actually have put it, but not on the overlay. Uh, so. In Blitz X, there has been 10 hours worth of games played. Uh, 11 hours, actually. The total game duration on this map is is this. So I'm going to paste it in chat. That's how long people played on this map. And you know what most of that is? Most of that is TBT. <laughs> We've had so many TBTs on this map. Definitely a great map for it. Very easy to split down the middle. There is the kind of funny X in the middle, which makes it very hard to push through anyway. And there's also an island base around here, which is essentially impossible to take in TBT. So uh, essentially both players can get a maximum of four gases. Uh, you've got the natural main middle base here and the gas base down here. And then if things get really crazy, the island base as well. But very, very unlikely we'll get to see that taken. That's just kind of how Blitz X plays in TBT. But... Definitely should see it split in the middle. You can see Koga already playing incredibly greedy, but very safe in a way because he knows uh, that this is a very hard map to be aggressive early on. So he's going for 14 CC here. Gonna have to build his barracks next to it. Now, one thing he's gonna have to be careful of is he's gonna have to send another SCV uh, to deal with this one. Yeah, you can already see he's got it ready. Just getting ready to deal with this now. 
The purpose of this is because you don't want to get your command center delayed. Now, you could argue that being forced to pull that is annoying and definitely problematic, but it's not too much of a big deal anyway. Uh, you still get the added benefit later. Now, Tengu is actually going to gas steal his opponent. Now, this is not something you would normally see in a TBT. That's 100 minerals that aren't going to be going to his factory, which he's getting ready to get now. He's got the gas, but he doesn't have the mineral count yet. So, it uh, looks like, okay, the factory is coming up. Uh, what did... Ah, uh, I mistimed everything in my head, but yeah, his expansion is going to be a little bit later. If he's going for a starport or anything like that, it's going to be a little bit later as well. And overall, Koga definitely has the advantage. And the other thing is, he can just take his natural gas. Like, he would normally want to have his gas or any, but the bunker keeps you alive against pretty much most things early on in TVT. Obviously, a tank is going to be annoying to deal with, but it's a long way away. Tengu is continuing to add on marines, which is kind of an interesting choice here, but... Wait, did he just... Oh, he's not, actually. Yeah, he is. He's going up to three. Okay. When you're going to three Marines in TBT, you know that you want to be a little bit more aggressive. Now, he's actually going to go into a fourth one as well. Now, the weird thing about how this is probably going to play out is we're going to see Tengu looping around the bottom of the map and trying to put some pressure on the bunker with likely an un tank. You can do it with Siege as well, but definitely going to go into that tank. Now, this isn't guaranteed to work. Uh, but if you've got four marines like he has done, if he sends an SCV as well, you can actually build a bunker like here or something. And it's it's not a big deal, but you know what it does? It stops your Terran opponent really being able to do anything because they kind of get it sets you up with a good position to contain. If your opponent goes for like a starport or something, the bunker is going to negate any early wraiths. Now we do have a starport up here. He is going to go race himself. Uh, so it's a 1-1-1 build in this TVT. Now the way this build works is it just allows you to put on a ton of pressure. You'll have the wraith go into the main. That's going to force the marines away from the bunker. Which means the units at the front can push forward. Now how many marines did Kog actually build? He went for three in the bunker. He's adding an additional two. I think he did see some units leaving the base here with his... Oh here we go there's the bunker. And it just gives you a really good staging ground. Now, Marines against Marines is a pretty fair fight. Uh, but depending on whoever gets the first shot can definitely win it. Now, one at the SCV from Koga goes down. Tengu getting the better end of this deal. And if he gets this bunker up, it's going to be so annoying to deal with. But gets a... Oh my god, that clip shot on that Marine. Losing another Marine, though. Tr oh my god, he's one hit away from killing the SCV on the bunker. He's going to try and come in. Oh, he doesn't... Oh, he doesn't get it. That's so annoying. Oh, he's going to be in so much trouble. The Wraith is going to be in the main base now. We're going to see double Starport coming in here from Koga, but one of them isn't even building. The SCV is definitely under fire here. There's no armory. Uh, there's going to be no armory in production either, and he's just lost all his anti-air. This is single Wraith. Yes, it's going to take forever, but it's causing a ton of problems here for Koga. Koga needs these starports done. And we have two tanks. Three tanks coming down here on the bottom. I didn't see if he got siege mode. Uh, but his gas is quite low. So I think he did. He still doesn't have an expansion. The command center only just now coming up. And this is looking bad for Koga. If Koga can hold on to this. It's going to be ridiculous. Siege mode is done as well. Look at this. This is crazy. How is he going to deal with it? He's going to pull SCVs. SCVs are very strrong against siege tanks when they can't do anything. Uh, so that's definitely going to help him out. The bunker going to be very annoying here to deal with. But yeah, one of the tanks goes down. Both of the tanks go down. That's only two of three though. Where the hell is this tank getting himself stuck? I didn't even know you could go behind this sign. Uh, but looks like the bunker is being used or the... The barracks is being used to soak up the bunker hits. Now there's two wraiths over here. An armory trying to go in. In the hidden part of Kogut's base. He's, this is a mistake. He's going into a start, an add-on first. Oh, there is a wraith out here. But Oh, he does need to be careful. Does want to lose it. Oh, cloaking. Cloaking is done. And he's got no answer to this. He's got no academy. He's got no engineering bay. How can Koga hold on to this? He's, oh my god, he's pulled the Marines. He's gone on top of the tank. This is really, really good. He's going to get another siege tank. Tengu only on one gas for the time being. His second base just finishing up here. 
but the cloak wraiths are going to be so annoying. The commsat is done, but cloak is not done from Koga, and every single wraith that comes out here is going to go down. It's three wraiths against none. There is absolutely no chance of Koga dealing with anything here. Now, Goliaths are coming in. Uh, we've got Charon boosters coming in as well. But Koga is in so much trouble. The one benefit he has is, yes, he's lost SCVs, but he's been on two expansions for a very long time. Now, the Marine's coming back, trying to help out, do a little bit of extra damage. The Wraith energy is very low. And he is eventually going to be able to clean this up. He does have a scan, which he doesn't want to waste. Uh, but looks like the race is going to come over here into the natural. Now, the one benefit Koga has behind this is, of course, if things keep going the way they're going, he is going to be at a deficit, but he's got a, a worker advantage. He's got a supply disadvantage. But he does have an advantage when it comes to race. Like, he is going to be on double race production. Tengu has stopped and going into, uh, into a uh, dropship here. So, if Koga continues building those wraiths, Koga could swing this back. It's going to be very difficult. It's very unlikely that Tengu is going to get too much anti-air, given the fact he already has the wraith advantage. And the game was kind of normalized, because neither player at this point can really kill each other. Looks like Tengu getting it ready to go for a drop, likely over in to the, uh, the main base of his opponent, dropping off on this island could be a very good staging point. Uh, we're going to get this expansion as well, just getting ready now. Koga's got a lot of units out the front. He does have turrets coming in as well, which does, of course, help out. Now, here comes the dropship. Can he snipe the dropship with his wraith? It's going to be difficult. He does see it, I believe. Okay, there we go. We're going to have a cloak by his opponent. Oh, my God. There's, there's no scanning available for Tengu. Koga's going to be able to get the dropship. Oh, my God. This is so, so good. This is such a good move by Koga to be able to do this. The counter cloak, even when Tengu knew it was coming, he didn't have the economy to build the academy to deal with it. So this is definitely looking really good for Koga right now. Obviously with the economy advantage, a massive one as well. Now I do wonder, can you walk a marine up that? That's so strange. Is that a ramp? No, I guess it's not, right? No, it's not. They're everywhere. That would have been really weird if you could. Yeah, but Koga going back into Cloak is actually really clever, and he's going into Valkyries as well. My favorite. Valkyries are the best units. I love them. Now, the one problem with Koga building his armory out here is it is incredibly exposed to pretty much any drop. So... Yeah, it kind of looks like a ramp, but it's not. It's just part of the decoration. I can't believe I've never noticed it before. <laughs> but here we go. We're going to have another drop coming in. Two, tank, or two tanks even going to be making their way into Kogut's main here. Now an SCV going to come out and scout this. Kogut's so clever. Look at that. Going to build a turret there and it's going to die. But still pretty good. Now Kogut is going to be in a little bit of trouble here because he doesn't actually have that many ground units in his main. Uh, of course, there is a Valkyrie here. That's not going to help him too much, but double dropships coming in now. This is getting more and more heated. Koga going to try and get in position. He does, of course, have the vision advantage, but this armory is going to go down before plus one attack can be finished. Now, does Tengu have his plus one attack coming in? No, he doesn't. So upgrades aren't going to be too much of a big deal, but without being able to build Goliath, you are in a bit of trouble. Now, let's see how this Valkyrie is going to go. Uh, looks like a lot of SCVs transferring into the middle of the map. Koga getting ready. Uh, I think all of his wraiths went down or something because it all disappeared. But Koga losing a little bit in his main. Tengu definitely in a good spot. Oh, Koga hasn't finished building the command city yet. The SCV was taken down. So annoying to be able to deal with that. Uh, but Koga still not in a terrible spot. He's got a lot of units back in his main to deal with any further drops. Which is very light to come in. Tengu getting ready with a second dropship. Is he going for a third? No, he's not. So it's just going to be two dropships dropping for the time being. But you can see a lot of SCVs being pulled. And Koga really making use of his better economy here. Pulling those SCVs, helping out the best he can. And he still has an 8 SCV advantage over his opponent. Now Koga, third gas is done immediately. A couple of wraiths coming in here. But all of Koga's units are in his main. So this is definitely going to cause a problem. Going for one of the dropships isn't able to do it. So, so low. Oh, he does. He gets the other one. 
That's a good move, but the trouble is Koga is going to be the one scrambling here to get back to his base. This third is so, so important in this matchup. He's going to siege. Looks like target firing not too great here from Tengu, so he is going to lose one of his tanks for free. The Goliaths will eventually kill this command center, but the tanks, as soon as they've dealt with this tank, can just un-siege and go and push. As long as he repairs this, he should be fine now. Looks like he's getting ready to go in. He needs to repair the command center, though. This is going to be so unbelievably important. Losing the dropships, Tengu is going to have a... Oh, my God, losing the second one as well. Tengu has lost a lot of his momentum in this game. Without the constant drops, it's going to be difficult for Tengu to put too much pressure on. Now, looks like we are going to have a tank sieging up in the middle, getting a nice shot on both of those tanks. Really juicy there. Uh, double Wraith still in production for Koga. Don't believe the Valkyrie is still alive, unfortunately. We didn't really see it do too much, but such is the life of a Valkyrie in any matchup. <laughs> I think he killed a lot of the Wraiths, though, so that's a bonus. There's only only three left, so... Tengu definitely in a good spot. Koga, though, still with a supply lead. Definitely making this as hard as possible, building a ton of turrets, making sure that drops are not going to cause too much damage, even leaving a good number of tanks at the back end of this base, because he knows the drops are going to try and unload up here. And that's essentially all you need to do in TVT on this map. You need to defend your bases, and you need to go and expand. And it looks like Koga wants to try and get a fourth base down here. Now Tengu is going to loop around the middle and try and secure this location on the high ground, which is going to stem the flow of Koga's units. It's going to make it very difficult for him to take a fourth base. But Tengu is on a clock here. Koga getting in position. Scans going down from both players, knowing exactly what's going on. And Koga is actually going to secure this high ground, which is perfect. It looks like Ke or Keebs or Kebez is seeing there's been a lot of supply blocks going on in the game. I mean, it is a pretty tense TVT. Supply blocks in TVT, yes, they are important, as in any matchup. But things can be so slow in TVT that even if you're down, like, 50 supply... Your units are so strong that you can still hold on. So it's not the biggest eel. He does, of course, still have the worker advantage, but does want to eventually stop on workers because one of the problems you can run into, in TVT especially, is you overbuild workers and you lose in the tank count. Now, let's check what's going on for both players. We've got five factories here, four Kogut, uh, four Tengu even. We've got three for Koga, still continuing with this double factory production. Uh, but the upgrades, I think, are favoring Tengu right now. Plus one attack is almost done. Uh, did Oh, Koga's actually double. Oh my god, Koga's going straight into ship weapons. Koga is essentially saying, you are going to win the ground war. I do not care. I'm going to go BCs before you win that way. He's going to have four gases soon. That is exactly the amount of gas you want for a BC. And given how easy it is to defend your locations on the map, going for the double ship uh, ship upgrades is actually incredibly clever. It gives you such a good advantage leading into the late game. Now, I don't see the science facility yet, so we're going to be a while off being able to get the physics lab, uh, which is obviously an important... Ah, here it is. He's hiding it. This is even better. Now, if he goes ghosts, I'm just going to be happy. Like it... No, okay, so it is going to be a physics lab. Uh, but Physics Lab's good. This is a really, really nice place to put the Physics Lab as well. It's out of scan range, essentially. And pretty much you won't ever be looking there uh, with a scan, because there's no reason to. It's very good to put starports there as well. It's out of your main base. Now, both players are still scanning around, trying to see what's going on. Uh, we see Koga scanning the units of the map, trying to decide whether or not it's worth trying to push forward. But given the fact he is kind of giving up the ground game, I'd definitely say it's better for him to just sit back. It does, of course, lead to some pretty kind of slow moments, which isn't too bad. Now, look at that scam from Tengu. It just... Oops, sorry. It just missed the physics lab, which is uh, not something you want to be in. Well, it's not something you want to do, essentially, because you need to know when your opponent's going for battle cruisers. Now, if he scans and sees the starports, he should know, given the fact they all do have control towers, but it's not beyond the... Okay, I was going to say it's not beyond the realms of possibility that he could just be going for a ton of uh, dropships, but... No, I mean, it's it's definitely, definitely uh, battle cruisers here. Now, 
Tengu did actually go back into dropships, but didn't really get too much. He's actually gone into mass Valk as well. This is three Valkyries. This is a ton of gas. And honestly, they're good against mass rates, but when you're up against BCs, they basically tickle the battle cruisers. Like, Valks are not good against anything with high armor. They're definitely better early game against Wraiths and Mutilus, but as soon as you get Carapace and armor upgrades, if you're behind in ship weapon upgrades compared to their ship plating, your Valks are not going to do anything. They're going to die almost immediately. I mean, the good thing is they do take out any Wraiths a little bit better, so you can't really mix them in. Now we've got triple battle cruisers coming in. Both. This is really cool. Like, it's entirely pointless to do this, but if Tengu scans now, he's not going to see the proper BC count unless he scans perfectly in the middle here. Okay, now it doesn't matter. I thought that was, like, intentional. That would have been amazing. Not necessarily be ghost stars. If uh, if anyone's wondering what he said, he said it makes it so you have to split the BCs. They do such little damage, it doesn't really matter. <laughs> it's kind of funny how little damage they do. BCs have incredibly high armor, though. I believe they have two base armor, is it? So they have three base armor and plus one. So they're on four armor. And Valks do six damage per rocket. And look at this, the race are microing down the... Oh my god, Kogut's race is so fun to watch. He is so good at race micro, it's really cool. Now he's going to lose all his rates, but it's not necessarily a big problem because he wants that supply for BCs anyway. Killing all the Valks is definitely a problem. Now triple dropship is going to be strong, but let's have a look at the great wall of turrets here from Kogut. How on earth are you going to get dropships through? I'll tell you, you're not going to. Now, Tengu has an amazing position out on the middle of the map where essentially he's saying, if you go ground, you can't break through, but that doesn't matter. Cook isn't going ground. He's happy to sit back. He's happy to sit back and wait. His bases are going to mine out a little bit quicker, but he should be a little bit more... Um, he should be a little bit more efficient with his supply. Uh, but looks like Koga even giving up some of his SCVs now just to get rid of the supply because he wants as many battle cruisers as humanly possible. Now, big. Oh, I thought this. Oh my god, this is clever. Look at what Tengu's doing. He's going to send the engineering bay in to eat all of the shots from the missile turrets. Okay, he's not. He's given up. But uh, he's probably realized hey, there's actually too many turrets here for me. But uh, it's something really cool you can do. You can send like a command center or an engineer and build barracks or something over the turrets to eat all the shots. And then you send in your uh, dropships afterwards. You know, he's got all of his units in the dropships. We've, we've got SCVs killing turrets. Oh my god, they're going to kill it. Is he going to repair the turret? I don't think he is, but here we go. The wraiths and the engineering bay are going to be used here to try and soak up some of the hits. But these, <laughs> these units are going to drop in hell. This is not where you want to be dropping off. The battle cruiser's coming up as well. All of the dropships go down. And Koga in an incredible position now. He's up 40 supply on his opponent. He's got 6 BCs already. There's another 3. Halfway done. This is where the tables flip for Tengu. Because Tengu is going to be low on gas, high on minerals. He's trying to go into BCs himself. He's only just now getting the Yamato upgrade. But let me tell you something. Koga... Is on 2-2 two -two air, uh, I believe, if I'm not miscounting. Where did the BCs go? Yeah, 2-2 two -two air. It's going to be 2-2 two -two against 0-0. Zero -zero. Let me tell you how that goes. Not well. Ghosts can lock down BCs, but even then it's very hard. Um, it's They also can't deal with 5, I don't think, because lockdown, I think, is 100 energy. But you still have to have something that can kill the BCs afterwards. And that's something that Tengu doesn't have right now. Like, he lost a lot of his units in those dropships. You can already see Koga pushing perfectly, going in with the BCs first. When he knows the tanks are gone, he moves his tanks up. And he is about to put a very, very strong contain on his opponent. Going to be able to cut off the bottom right-hand bases as well. Yamato being used on the tanks. Definitely good to do. Making sure to kill as many of these. I mean, it's 2-1 or two one upgrades against 1-0. Which is obviously a big deal, but I mean, 2-1 upgrades don't save you against Yamato, so 
That's what we're doing. We're gonna go mass Yamato here for Koga. He's gonna get another Yamato on another tank. Nicely done. I'm gonna zoom out a little bit because TVT, it feels like the zoom out function was made for TVT. You can, it's so much better. Here we go. He's gonna clone another couple of battle cruisers off. Double Yamato getting another couple of tanks here. And things are going from bad to worse for Tengu. Tengu, of course, with more workers, but that supply that isn't gonna be helping him deal with battle cruisers. And the BCs from him should be coming out, but they've got no upgrades. And without any upgrades, how do you stand up against this many BCs? It's 11 BCs already. 22 minutes, 11 BCs. Koga just gave up on ground a long, long time ago. He does not need that many ground units on this map to hold on. Now, there's a lot of Goliaths. But Goliaths, as long as you defend your tank, or defend your BCs with the uh, with the tanks even, the Goliaths don't do too much. Now, obviously, the upgrade's going to be very, very important. There's actually not that much defending this high ground. I mean, if Tengu can get in and he can kill all the production, and then somehow deal with the BCs, he's still in a good spot. But... He has to be able to hold on. His bank of gas isn't that high. The tanks are going to take out his other two bases. You can see Tengu is mostly on Goliaths right now. And without tanks, you can't deal with these tanks. Like, you've got a couple of BCs yourself. But that's not going to help you too much. Now, we have got BCs from his opponent. 6 versus 11 still. I think Koga should have been building more back at home. But with 11 versus 6, that's... Uh I mean, I'm not good at maths, but that's not great. <laughs> uh, but you can already see the, the command center trying to fly away, but look at this. BC is going to catch up to it, going to be able to kill it. The engineering bay actually getting in the way. Not helping too much, but the BCs of his opponent are slowly building up. The upgrades are slowly starting to come in. We've got 1-1. One, one. Now, is 3-3 three, three almost done? Yes, it is. 3-3 three, three about to tick over. And look how much damage these BCs are doing. That's 25 plus 9. That's 34 damage per shot. And then the anti-air is the same. So that's crazy. And they're going to be taking 6 less damage from his opponent's BCs. But realistically, that isn't much. But then when you take into account the, uh, take into account the Goliath's attack goes down to 22. BCs have 500 health. Like, that's, that's a lot of health. <laughs> now, do we have the 12th one there yet? No, we don't. So, oh my god, he's actually going up to 15. Here comes more and more Yamato's coming in, gets another tank, but one of the BCs looks like it's about to fall down. He does lose a BC, actually, so not the best engagement from Koga. Tengu definitely doing his best here, trying to get as many pot shots off as possible. He is going to be relying on his massive mineral bank. Oh, he didn't actually get the CC in the bottom right either. And he's repairing it. Tengu, so good. STPL is Kal-El, aka <laughs> Superman's dad. Kal-El is uh, Superman. jor I think, is um, Superman's dad. Dark Holiday. Well-known Ling all -Liner, Dark Holiday. Now Tengu going to expand to the bottom right again. There is a lot of gas in this base. Meanwhile, gas still quite high on Koga's bases as well, not doing too bad. We still have a good number of BCs in the back, but look at this. Tengu getting more and more BCs himself. He has the additional anti-air with these Goliaths, but Koga... Uh, Koga moving... Oh, STPLL. Okay, yeah, yeah. Nice. Uh, but looks like the... Oh my god, the tanks are gonna give themselves away, but look at the Yamato! Getting one BC immediately. A lot of the Goliaths have gone down. And it's down to... Why can't I count? Seven BCs against 12 again. In fact, I think there might even be more here. Yamato going to continue to come out. There we go. GG. Dengu knows he has nothing left. There's tanks down in the bottom right, killing everything else. And what a great TVT. Koga pulling it back one to one. Now that's definitely what we want to see. We want to see one to one. We want to see two to two, and then we want to see an ace match around this out because that will kind of mimic what we saw back in season one. In season one, uh, the playoffs were a slightly different format. Uh, essentially, uh, in SCPL season one, the semi-finals and the quarterfinals were best of three, best of fives, 
And White Clan went up against uh, Net Wars then, and they went to the final series. So they uh, they were one one in series, and then they went to the ace match in se- in the third series, which was ridiculous. But let's go to another quick break, and when I get back, we'll be heading in to game number three. It's going to be uh, Jesse versus Zero. Easily no. Thank you, Chamba, for the MFW, sub. MFW, my sub is recurring now. I need to hit 12 <laughs> months. Thanks, man. Uh, really, really cool. Let's go to a quick break. Jesse is going to be playing a PvZ up against Fairy. This could be one of the more single, the single-sided, one-sided uh, games of the series, but hopefully it should still be good. See you guys very soon. STP Outdoors! Bio TVP? Wow! You got it! STP Outdoors! Mass Scouts? No problem! Broadcast three nights a week on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, 2100 CEST. Fantastic casting, fantastic production, fantastic prizes. Only here on the STPL. Did you know Reavers could be this radical? How did these lings even get here? All I know is that's one dead base. STPL does! Wraiths, Valkyries, Carriers, and Corsairs. Forget about it. You won't see that anywhere else. STPL does. STPL does. STPL does. STPL does. STPL does. DT's doing game ending damage. Name a more iconic duo. We've even got carriers in PvZ. How amazing! A global team league on the scale you've never seen before. Don't see this in beta, but you see LSTPL does. All that and more, only on this amazing 64-bit STPL. What BWCL don't. Impressed? I know I am. Why not support us on the link below? Patreon.com forward slash kicks. But act fast. It's a limited offer.
Okay, guys, welcome back. We're here for game number three between White Clan, sorry, and Net Wars. Uh, starting to feel the uh, horrible effects of the cold I've got while trying to cast, but that's fine. We'll get through it. Now, thank God the next game is on uh, is on top versus bottom because man, those colors are rough to see on the mini map. <laughs> It's all good though. Uh, luckily enough, we're we're here with uh, some good colors now. So far, we've seen Net Wars and White Clan go one to one. Uh, I kind of feel like yeah, Kogut's win streak in TVT is ten zero now, which is insane. Just pointing that out. Uh, he's actually matching up with uh, Dewalt, Noob, and Yeti. I think for PVP win streaks, which is eleven, or is it Bonneth? Hold on. Uh, luckily enough, I can look at it whenever. Yeah, Noob, DeWalt, and Bonneth all have an 11-0 PvP streak, which is ridiculous. Cold is not unironically coronavirus, thankfully. Um, let's introduce both of our players now. These two players, uh, Fairy, definitely a little bit more well-known, but Jesse, kind of a lower-level player. She's kind of CPL level, but still a very, very strong uh, she's mainly a Terran player, but does play Zerg and Protoss as well. She stepped in for Catpaw, so uh, that's why she, she'll be here. She was playing Zerg in our last game against Castle, which didn't go as well, uh, but this is going to be a PvZ this time, so I think... Fire from Poland. Did the, Wait, what? Oh man, I got some of the flags around the wrong way. What it was, guys, was essentially I had to recode everything yesterday to put everything on there. It took me like four hours, and a lot of the flags seemed to be around the wrong way. So, Spire is switched with True Touch. So, I know what ones are wrong. It looks like it's mainly the ZVZ ones that are wrong, actually. I'm looking at all of them. Uh, but, regardless, uh, looking at Jesse, I don't know too much about her. She streams a lot, though. And she does a pretty good job. She's in my, yeah, she's in my CPL team now. I think she's tier zero and I'm tier one. I'm surprised I'm tier one, to be honest. I thought I'd be tier two now, but oh well, that's not too bad going into tier one. Hopefully I'll be able to win a couple of games. I know there's a lot of downtime in between these games, by the way, guys, but we have got a lot of time to fill, given there's only one series today. Uh, let's have a look at her opponent. It's going to be Fairy for White Clan. Now, Fairy... Definitely a little bit more well-established in the STPL ecosystem. Uh, playing 11 games overall, winning 7 of them. And Fairy's actually an X-Height Sparky's pro, which many people may not remember him because it was a long, long time ago that he played for Sparky's. It was a long time ago since Sparky's existed, uh, but definitely a very, very strong Zerg player. Not had the best results. Uh, one of the biggest upsets I think we had was him losing to Essen on Neo Arkanoid, but that that <laughs> that was Essen's patented uh, Essen's patented six minute challenge build on Neo Arkanoid, where he just built a lot of lings and pushed his way through. But luckily enough, we're not going to see that on this map. Although I, I must admit, it's quite a fun build to watch. Definitely, definitely something I wasn't expecting to see when I first made the uh, map pool. But Essen coming out with a lot of fun. A lot of fun, fun builds. Now, the map they're going to be playing on uh, is maybe a little bit more familiar to you guys rather than the last two. Although, Neo, New Tornado is one of the more standard ones. Yeah, Sparky's wasn't a super memorable team. Mainly, well, mainly because they didn't have, like, a huge number of really, really good players. They didn't really contest the title or anything. But Gogo -Go was on Sparky's. Uh, Up Magic, I think, was Sparky's as well. Uh, you also had Mong. Uh, Mong was Sparky's and he got messed over by his coach, I think it was, because they didn't pay him much because he didn't look as good as the other players. Uh, but the, the main Sparky's player I remember is um, Gogo, and then he got banned for match fixing, so a little bit unfortunate. There was actually a lot of uh, match fixing players on Sparky's. I think Yellow Ansi may have been on um, Sparky's as well, but Multiverse is going to be the map from one of the recent... Uh, one of the recent... Sorry, um... One of the recent ASLs, but yeah, uh, very, very fun map in terms of records for the team. So I don't know if you guys have noticed, but I've got that now. Netwars have actually won five of their games here, uh, where White Clan have only won two. So, and yeah, Later was on Sparky's as well, wasn't he? I forgot about that. Later, I think, was probably the best player, but I can't believe I forgot. <laughs> Later was really cool. Lomo was on Oz, wasn't he? So it wasn't, yeah, either way. Uh, let's get into game number three. It's Jesse versus Fairy, and it's here on Multiverse.
Okay, starting us off here in the top right hand position, in close by air positions to her opponent, it's Jessie fighting for Poland for Net Wars. And her opponent spawning down here in the bottom right hand corner, once again as I said, close by air, which is going to benefit PVC for sure. Uh, it's Fairy fighting for White Clan from South Korea as the red. Uh, the red. Zerg. Meta Luxury was on KT, wasn't he? At least I thought he was. I'm gonna look this up while uh, we're in the downtime. Sure, Luxury was on KT. Oh, he was on Sparkies for two years and then moved to KT. I looked it up on Liquipedia. By the way, guys, shout out to our sponsor, Liquipedia. Uh, Liquipedia is an amazing resource for many, many different games. There are so many really important contributors who do a lot. Finkfin especially. Shoutouts to him and Ziggy for helping out with the STPL. Uh, I think both of them are adding all of the results, so it's really, really cool. Uh, they're a really good resource, really, really great. They've given us $500 towards the prize pool, and they're doing a bracket. Well, they we're in the middle of a bracket contest, so that's pretty good. Yeah, Luxury was on Sparky's first, and then he moved on to KT. Well, not first. He was on a team called Core uh, from... Oh, it was it was Sparky's before they were called Sparky's. They started in 2000 under the name Core. Yeah, everyone's right. We can all be happy here now. Let's see what we're going to have here. Looks like we are going to have a overpool. Uh, yeah, this was an overpool, I think, for Fairy. Going to go for an expansion hatchery after this on 12 Supply. Jesse is going for one base play, which is the important thing to note here because Jesse, as I said, is going to be the player who's going to struggle a little bit given the caliber of opponent. It's a best of one. And one of the things I've pointed out many times in the STPL is in a best of one, anything can happen. All you need to do is prepare well enough. You come out with a build specific for a map and you can catch people off guard incredibly easily. It happened to Scan with Favorite on Sin Peaks of Baekdu in Season 1. Uh, Favorite proxy gated, DT rushed uh, Scan. He didn't scout it and he got killed with no detection. So anyone can win in a best of one. And I'm interested to see what exactly Jesse has planned for us. Now, uh, Erob saying, will Bonnet still play? I believe he will. He's still on the Soul roster, so I don't see why he wouldn't do. Uh, but unfortunately, he's not on the NetWars roster after Season 2. So, uh, definitely a big loss for NetWars roster, for sure. And that's one of the other things I brought up early in the stream. Like, NetWars are a really strong team still. But they've only really got four super strong players in Ziggy, Zero, Koga, and Yeti. Yeti suffers from the fact he's got wrist injuries. Koga isn't super active, uh, but obviously still comes out and completely owns people in STPL. And... Uh, Ziggy, not super active, but really good. Plays both StarCraft 2 and StarCraft 1, and as well as casts, of course, as you well know. And um, Zero, of course, doesn't really have too much time for playing, so uh, not the best. But they still come out every week, and they've done a very, very good job. But Soul is still such a strong team, but even then, Fink Finn, there was, there was always better players than Bonneth on Soul, but he still came out every week. It's not based on who the strongest is on Soul who plays. It's based on who is gonna like who is available to play. Now Jesse is going oh what the hell? How did the Lings get past this? Yeah, Jesse going for a Reaver build and it's been scouted, so I'm not so sure uh, that this is gonna work out too well. Yeah, Fake Finn, uh, they did add Soma, Mighty, and Sexy. Uh, Sexy was an old pro. Soma, obviously, the top amateur right now. Mighty, another good amateur player. Uh, but they're not guaranteed to play every week. They, he mainly added them to the roster to try and fight against White Clan and Valhalla team's top players. And if we're going to see Soul against White or Valhalla team, 
It's going to be in the finals, so... Well, I say the finals. It'll be the finals or third or fourth place match, but... We've got to go through the semi-finals first, and whoever wins here is going to go up against Valhalla team. Uh, True Touch has moved on to IRK. Uh, he did get a bit tired of playing in team leagues, but now he moved to IRK. So I don't know if he's going to play for them in STPL. Uh, we could see him next week with Soul versus IRK. Uh, I definitely think IRK have a chance of taking down Soul. Uh, they've got Dewalt. Uh, they've got so many good players as well. So never, ever count anyone out. But he did play for Net Wars. All of the Polish players used to play for Net Wars, but now Bonus and True Touch switched out, essentially. Now, the state of this game is we've obviously still got Jesse getting ready for this Reva drop. Two links in the main still being incredibly annoying to deal with. Low economy for both players, though. Only 15 drones. But look at this. Look at how many Hydras are coming across the map. Oh, my goodness. Uh, lately, there was an ASL match where two soul players played each other. Did they? Did Salop play against Noob or something? No, Zealot didn't make it into this one, I don't think. Uh, but looks like the Reaver is going to be able to be used to defend against this, but needs to be careful, does want to lose these. Jesse actually pulling a lot of uh, workers off mining, not what you want to do. Seoul essentially do have two teams, foreign and Korean, uh, but having them mixed together is better for everyone because everyone gets bigger. Uh, everyone gets better. Like, one of the things I've noted in my interview with Tai 2 is the level of play from the foreign players in STPL have done incredibly well. Like, they have done so, so much better than they ever did before. Oh my goodness. Oh, the shawl goes down. I did think that this was going to be a little bit one-sided, unfortunately, for Jesse. But Jesse still coming out here, showing a good game, coming in with an interesting plan on our off race. And unfortunately, Fairy has just uh, just had the the better of it at this at uh, this point. I think now the Reaver back in the main is going to help, but still, two teams in STPL. I don't think would be better for competition either, because essentially you just have two. two like I'm going to say this, and I may be a little bit disintent dis. Trying to say the right word, disingenuous. I don't know if that's the right word for the situation. But the thing is, like, the top two teams would just be Soul Gaming. <laughs> because, yes, they have strong Korean players, but they have incredibly strong foreign players as well. They've got Dandy, they've got Tai 2, they've got Bonith, they've got. Uh, I know they added other people as well. They've got Babo and stuff like that. Uh, they've got Ziki as well. Like,. Their foreign team is crazy good. Like, crazy good. They're going to destroy BWCL. Like, Seoul is in BWCL. They've picked up a lot, of, a lot of foreign players for that as well because they couldn't enter with Koreans, of course. But it's just getting harder and harder. Like, Seoul, they do play their... Or they pay their players if they win. So, essentially, it's like... If you come out and win... Oh, yeah, they have Gory Niche as well. Uh, it's like, if you come out and win, you get some money. I don't know how much it is, but essentially it's... It's an incentive to practice. And I know a lot of people are like, well, that isn't fair. But at the end of the day, I want to build an ecosystem if I can. Where every team can do that. We're a way off, but... One of, the, one of my goals for the league is to make that possible for every single team. To make it better for everybody like well if you want to watch korean soul versus foreign soul i'm sure we can do some kind of show match i'm sure fuji would be happy to do that yeah like i it's one of those things where yeah they used uh tai two dandy and gory a bit uh gory niche they've used a little bit more recently because they've just added him tai two they were using for quite a bit in season two dandy hasn't been as active from what i understand he's sort of coming back but that would end up being, I guess, the start of a pro foreign scene, which I know is, like, a long, long way away. But it's why I'm trying so freaking hard. Like, a lot of the time, like, I spent all of yesterday coding overlay stuff. Like, for a lot of people, it doesn't matter, right? But the way I view it is I now have a really great database. I've got all of these cool statistics, 
all of them point out how good the players actually are and then using those statistics using the tournaments really does make me feel like I can build something and it's one thing that I'm going to be working passionately to try and do uh, over the next few years like I don't know if it's going to work out maybe it doesn't uh, but we've got another sponsor lined up for SCPL season 3 they have brought out mine the best yes and killer yes they did that against soul in in round one and against net wars in uh, round in the playoffs It's not Dildo King sponsorship, <laughs> uh, but unfortunately Jesse is in a big, big, pro a big, big amount of trouble now. Looks like Jesse gonna try and go for a hail mary attack at the front here, but losing all of her probes in the main definitely not good. Natural never actually started up, so this is gonna be do or die here for Jesse. If she can break through, she may be able to win the game. But seeing that, even if she can break through, she has nothing that can kill the Mutalisks, which is uh, not something you want to be dealing with. There isn't going to be any minerals here to be able to rebuild the Scarabs. Looks like the... Oh, the Reaver's going to survive. Oh my goodness, that Scarab could have been juicy. But unfortunately, just with nothing to deal with the Mutalisks here, this is not a good position for Jesse to be in. The Dragoons killing the... Well, sorry, the Mutalisks killing the Dragoons back in the main base. And the shot goes down. GG. I'm not even going to answer that question, Meta. <laughs> yeah, that was... I think when I looked at the lineups, that was always going to be the more one-sided game of this series, which isn't necessarily too bad. Like, Jesse subbed in for Catspaw. Honestly, I'm not sure how good Catspaw is either, uh, but Jesse is a Terran main, so... The fact that you came out and you played a pretty good game, you had a game plan as well, which is better than I can do as Protoss. Let me say that, Nil. That is going to put White Clan up 2-1 to one over their opponents of Net Wars. So this is going to be a do-or-die situation. I know I just said that, uh, but it's going to be do-or-die here. If they cannot win the next game, White Clan will be advancing into the semifinals. It's match point for them. And if Net Wars can win, we're going to go into an ace match on Neo Arkanoid, which is Kogut's home ground. So let's see what's going on. Uh, but yeah, Cat's Paw apparently isn't super strong either, according to Jesse. But either way, back in a moment. See you guys soon. People like Kix, for example, who has an encyclopedic knowledge of every map that's ever uh, been released on StarCraft. And He's the map man! Skibi dibi dibi on do do do. Skibi don do do do. Skibi dibi dibi on do do do. He's the map man! Ba da ba da ba dee da ba ba da bo. Ba 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 da bo. Be da ba ba da bo. Ba 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 da bo. Everybody plays one way or the other, so check out my message to you. As a matter of fact, I don't let nothing hold you back. If kicks can do it, so can you. Gooby dooby dooby dee da ba ba da bo ba 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 da bo. Please, please don't listen to him for maps. Yeah.
Welcome back, guys. We're going to be going into a ZVZ shortly, uh, but get you Barbara. From what I understand from Ziki, he's a Hungarian player who essentially did play back in the TSL days, I think. Oh, maybe not. 2010 to 2015. Like, he was one of the players who just never went to StarCraft 2. And essentially, while everyone else was playing StarCraft 2 for a while, he just essentially got really, really good. Like, he got way better than anyone in 2016. Uh, 2015 and 2016, I think. He pretty much won every single foreign tournament. Like, he in, essentially, he was just really, really good. Like, he was way better than everyone else in the foreign scene. Like... He, he just had, like, a ridiculous win rate. It's crazy. Um, obviously, he's disappeared for a while. Uh, but, yeah, Fake Finn saying he's won, like, half of all the Defiler Tours. And Defiler Tour was going on for a long time. That's crazy. Like, I remember when I first started coming back to cast in, like, 2015. Um, essentially, Sale was telling me how good Sinky was. And I had no idea because I was kind of in StarCraft 2 for a bit. Uh, but he was, yeah, as Model said, he was, like... The first person essentially to get really high rank on fish and he was beating pro gamers like Ziki was incredibly strong but talking of our incredibly strong players here we're going to start off with the one the only Mr. Bombastic it's Mr. Zero. Uh, Zero definitely a very very well known player. Very good uh, player overall. Uh, what was it? What was I gonna say? Uh, yeah, he's he's done an incredible good, uh, he's done an incredibly good job. He's fifty percent against Zerg, which is gonna help him a little bit in this game. But it is a ZVZ, which can be a little bit temperamental. Uh, definitely, even in the pro scene, we've had games where the better Zerg doesn't win. So regardless of how good at ZVZ you are, you can get upset pretty easily. Like I'm remembering, I think it was Effort versus Lava. In ASL 6, I believe, where it was uh, on Gold Rush, that may have been ASL 5. But if essentially, like, everyone thought Effort was going to win. Like, Lava's a good player, but Effort is, like, god of ZVZ, right? And then Lava comes out and he just completely blindsides him with this new idea for a build and just owns, right? I'm not sure Zero is quite at that level, but he is still an incredibly good ZVZ player. He's uh, rank 48 in the SDPL, which... I mean, when you look at his win rate, it's 53% overall. That goes to show how many strong players in the SCPL, guys. <laughs> Just saying. Let's have a look at his opponent. It's going to be Sack for White Clan. Uh, Sack hasn't played too much. It is a Zerg player. Not the pro Terran uh, from SKT. If it was him, I would actually lose my lose my insides because I absolutely love Sack. But this is the Zerg player, Sack. He's not played too many games. Hasn't played a ZVZ, so I'm not too sure about how his ZVZ is going to go. But, uh, very, very cool. So, hopefully, we're going to have a good ZVZ here. Let's have a look at the map we're going to be going on to. Whiteout, not the most obvious ZVZ map, uh, given the fact you'd expect uh, ZVZ. ZVZ plays kind of weird here, but it, star ratings, Fink Finn, are if you have five wins, you get a star. I need to put like a little infographic on the screen. Thank you for reminding me. I was going to do it yesterday and then forgot because uh, I was working on all those stat screens. But essentially, uh, ZVZ, definitely uh, weird here. I mean, it's not too big deal, like too big of a deal. Um, like the the forest in ZVZ doesn't really come into effect because all of your units are melee and the ones that aren't are flying. So <laughs> the forest doesn't do anything. But Zero is actually on a 2-0 win streak on this map. Uh, it's not in CVZ though, as you can see from the map history, but still, really, really good job. Both teams have done really well on this map as well, so this is a good map to see if we can get into an ace match. Let's get into game number four. It's Zero versus Sack here on Whiteout. Okay, starting us off here in the top right-hand position, we do have the blue Zerg player fighting for White Clan from South Korea. It's Sack.
and his opponent spawning down here in the bottom left or the top left hand corner in the yellow fighting or net wars from Poland it's Mr. Zero Okay, let's see what builds both of these players are going to do. Both of them have gone up to 9 supply. There's no spawning pools yet for either player. I'm very interested to see where they're going to go from here because 12 hatch, not too surprising from Zero. He does like to play macro ZVZ if that's really a thing. But it's more interesting to see what Sack's going to do here because does he know his opponent? Like, do either of these players know each other? I would highly doubt Zero knows Sack, but Sack has the ability to see a lot of Zero's old STPL games. Whether or not he does so is up to his uh, pejorative, obviously, but a prerogative, should I say? Pejorative is the wrong word, but it's not the pro game of Sack. It's not SKT Terran off racing, it's a different guy. Koreans really don't put much importance in their ID, but both of them are actually going to go 12 pool into 11 gas. So, mirror builds in a mirror matchup. Could we get any more STPL than that? <laughs> I'm not too sure, but yeah, essentially I know that Tasteless and Artosis brought this up before in one of the ASL casts, I think, where essentially, like... I wish we could have Pro Game Sack. I want all his replays. Like, I just want them all. I've got some from CMSL. I still need to finish casting CMSL. I'm so sorry, Caster Muse. If you're still here, I am incredibly sorry that I've not been casting it. I'm in the round of 16. It finished forever ago. Oh my goodness. Oh well, we'll figure it out. I'm off work soon, so we'll do something then. But And if we get, like, contained back at home for coronavirus, then I'll do it then. Yeah, looks like we have both players going into a lot of links here. Not too much surprising going on. Oh, and Custom Muse is still there. <laughs> I didn't call you. I was just saying I'm sorry for not finishing uh, Custom Muse Season... Well, Star League Season 2 yet. I'm, uh, I'm very, very far behind. So we have both players going for an expansion. Looks like Sack is going to be the player being a little bit more aggressive. Now this is a ZVZ, so honestly I don't see this game lasting much longer than 10 minutes. But will we get to the 6 minute mark is the important question. Not too sure, but let's have a look. We've got Lair coming in from both players at pretty much exactly the same time. But Zero is in a little bit of a Lair advantage here, which means the Spire will be ever so slightly quicker. Uh, but not quick enough to make a massive deal. Now, speed is done for both of our Zerg players here, I believe. I'm so bad at seeing if links are speed links. Yeah, they're speed links now. Okay. Now, speed links obviously better than slow links, so them both having speed uh, is super important. Looks like they got speed at the same time. <laughs> I'm, I'm really bad with speeds in Brood War. I don't know why. And just, uh, just while we're waiting for some of the kind of like some divergence to happen, I'd just like to say that like the funniest headline for me related to coronavirus is the fact that the stock of the Corona beer has gone right down because no one's buying it. Like, do people honestly think that it's caused by the beer? Like, I, I don't get it. Yeah, that was mainly in America as well. But yeah, people are dumb. Like, there was a... The, the problem we've got at the moment as a species is we need to con contain coronavirus, essentially, because it could get a lot worse. They're not smart, are you, Rob? Uh, Italy have made a complete mess of this whole thing. Like, I'd, I saw a funny meme the other day of, like, people with a cold and they're, like, laying in bed with, like, a, a towel over their head and whatever, just like, oh, I'm dying. And there's, like, people with a coronavirus and, like, stepping on a plane. <laughs> It's like, oh my goodness, why are people so unbelievably, um, 
you know what, let's just talk about the game rather than coronavirus. But either way, uh, we are going to have a push in from Sack here. Can he manage to get some of these buildings? Looks like he may be able to take down the gas. And if Zero moves to try and defend this... He's going to find himself getting caught off guard, but this gas is super important. Link's coming in from the top side, getting a definitely a good engagement here. Zero in a lot of trouble. There's so many links left over. The Mutilists are slowly starting to come out here, but look at how many links are on the way. Links are getting into the main base. There's no sunken. He didn't need a sunken before. He's playing a little bit greedy here. The links are going to get taken down, but Sack is now at a 2 Drone advantage, a three drone advantage, now four drone advantage, more and more drones going down. This could be the six minute curse enacting itself, but we've got, uh, oh, a mute list goes down to Scourge. Not, you hate to see it if you're going to use that meme, but this is definitely a problem for Zero. Zero in a lot of trouble here. The natural expansion is under fire, being down five drones is not where you want to be. More and more Scourge coming in, but great micro from Zero. To be able to deal with this, but losing an overlord as well. Not what you want happening. More and more drones going down in the main base. And Sack is pulling Zero apart here. Uh, but this is... Uh yeah, Queen CCC is going to be his new new ID. Uh, but this is not looking good for Mr. Zero here. Unfortunately, Mr. Bombastic is not looking Mr. Fantastic right now. He is in a big deficit. He's got a lot of mute lists, of course, which is... It is the vehicle back into a ZVZ. If he can strike now while the iron is hot, he's going to be able to get in and do some damage. But a lot of his mutilists are actually damaged. So let's see what his micro is going to be like. Obviously, ZVZ is all about the mutilist micro. It's going to be 8 versus 7. Looks like the better end of the engagement so far is going for Sack here. But oh, nice Scourge coming in behind from Zero. But Zero losing all of his mutilists here. This is going to be game over, I think. Unfortunately... A sad exit here for Netwars in the playoffs of SCPL Season 2. But GG, zero taps out and Sack wins game number four. So a little bit unfortunate there, of course. Whoa, what are we looking at here? Not looking at the right screen, that's that's for sure. Uh, but Zack isn't the pro Terran, um, but Zack is really good at ZVZ by the looks of it. Uh, but yeah, this is unfortunately going to be the end road for Net Wars in Season 2. Uh, they did struggle a little bit, as I mentioned, given the fact they lost both... Uh, they, they lost both Bonneth and through touch at the beginning of the series. But you know what? They still carried on. They still made it through with Yeti injured. And they made it into the quarterfinals of Season 2. They made it into the semifinals last time. But with the... With essentially the... Um, with essentially the amount of games they've played. And the amount they've done. I mean, Koga is ranked 3 in the SDPL. Koga, I see you in chat, man. You're doing an incredibly good job in the SDPL. Hopefully, you stay in for Season 3. I know NetWars are a little bit unsure given they've not got too many players right now. But if they do stay, uh, look forward to seeing a lot more of Koga, I would say, because Koga definitely the ace in the hole here for Netwars. And Radley left as well, but he left in the middle of Season 1, so that's not too much of a big deal at, at this point. But he's doing really good for Ash. But either way, great games played by Netwars. Unfortunately, at the end of the day, White Clan played the better series, and they won. Uh, why doesn't the cheer for Netwars trigger an on-screen pop do any of them trigger an on-screen pop-up i didn't even know you could but yeah thank you um thank you so much for netwars for participating in season two you've led some amazing games koga i don't know if you know this man i'm going to show this off look at your win streak in tvt it's 10 now and you've got a 10 win streak going in tvt so you have to come back you have to come back in Season 3 regardless, because you need to keep it going. You, you're like, what? Well, you're insane, man. You're on 10-0 in your overall games. No, you're 11-0 in your overall games. So you've almost got the highest win streak in the league, which is crazy. So, regardless... Oh, oops, uh, wrong button. That is going to be the end of the quarterfinals for Season 2. Uh, we're going to have... Let's actually head on over to the... 
Obviously, this isn't up to date, but we'll have a look at it anyway. We're going to have White Clan moving on to face off against Valhalla team. IRK are going to be... Uh, what was I going to say? Um, IRK is going to be up against Soul. Valhalla team up against White Clan. And this is looking to be one of the coolest brackets we've had. Really, really good job by everyone who's been involved. Some amazing upsets, some amazing games. Radley versus Bishop, man. That's, like, what else can you say? Like, Radley versus Bishop was one of the greatest games ever. I know that was Ash and not film. We are going to have some amazing semi-finals next week. Tune in next Sunday at 2100 CET as, well, not as always, but as always in the playoffs. It's IRK vs. Soul, Valhalla Team vs. White Clan, and I will see you guys next week. Have a very good morning, afternoon, or night, and stay the hell away from the coronavirus. See you guys soon.